two more minutes. Sorry. really nice to be here and be invited here um, to this amazing space. I'm so impressed, I have to say. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is international music PR. It's going to be split into two parts. Um, the first part, I'm going to tell you a bit about me and my company um, and like give you an overview of like the general international media landscape, different parts of it. Um, how to choose an agency, that kind of thing, if you want to go that route. And then the second part, we're going to talk about how you can do it yourself. And I'm going to do it um, like really step by step in a way that I've never done before and like break it down so that you kind of, anyone has the tools to do it themselves and then realise it's really hard and hire me. <laughs> so, um, I'm Melissa. Um, I've been running Taylor Communication now since 2006. Um, before that, um, I started out in music 25 years ago, um, promoting nights um, with my friends in Manchester and London. Um, I worked as a music journalist for a while. Um, I worked at the very first um, like clubbing online magazine that there ever was called Burn It Blue. Rest in peace. Um, and then I worked at Fabric Nightclub in London for five years. And there I did everything. I did international PR, I did local PR, I did radio, TV, made some horrific mistakes, uh, got quoted in national newspapers um, for really bad things. Um, I worked on everything from metal to drum and bass, house music. Um, I did the CDs and I literally had the greatest crash course in what to do and what not to do. And also um, it kind of put me in the way that I think about PR in a different way than a lot of people do because it was truly international. Um, so that's kind of my, my background. I then became completely burnt out working at a nightclub and I moved to Berlin and I started my company tailored. Um, so... Slide one, this is us. <laughs> so um, from left to right, that's Cassia, Marco, myself and Adam, and we're tailored. Um, there's only four of us. We, people think that we're a massive company. We're not and we never will be because I don't really believe in that and I love the way that small companies can do a lot. Um, so we, we're an independent company. Um, we do music communication, traditional PR, which is basically newspapers, magazines, online, blogs, radio, live streams, a um, bit of TV now and then. Um, and we also do a record pool, which is um, a way of us promoting like singles, basically, that, that don't need like very involved press. And we also do club promo, which means I send records to about 2,000 DJs um, of, of every persuasion. Um, so not every record is for everyone, obviously. 
Um, so our focus is on independent artists. Um, we do also work with major labels, although it's not my favourite thing to do. But as they say, it pays the bills. And um, that means we can offer more to truly independent people and support them in their journeys. Um, I do worldwide international press. Um, our focus is primarily on the UK, US and um, the EU. Um, on top of that, I also manage some people. Um, I've been managing people for about 10 years. I sometimes enjoy it and I sometimes don't. I stopped doing it for a while after two horrific experiences and um, I only started doing it again two years ago and I do it in a very different way and I think it's something that goes well with PR for truly independent artists to have somebody who has like a 360 vision of what they should be doing and like help them with their planning and stuff. Um, one of the things I want to say about PR <laughs> before we go much further is that we live in a capitalist system and PR and communication are used as tools within that to get people to buy shit that they don't need. Um, social media is a layer of that, um, which I, you know, it's, it's supposed to be about community and connecting people, but obviously it has hugely negative effects, um, as does PR and marketing. And one of the, the things that I think is important about what we do and, and why I love what I do is because when you're working with people closely and they have the same ideals as you, you can actually do things in a way that is not expected and things can be positive and can be ethical. And that's kind of how we try to do things. Um, so one of the things that sets Tailored apart is our website. Um, which I'm going to skip to. So our website, this is the third incarnation of the tailored website. And one of the reasons why only three publicists are able to do so much work is because we designed this amazing website that basically um, does all the reporting for us because I believe in transparency. <coughs> I believe if you're paying me to do a job, you should see what I'm doing. You should be able to see every pitch that I make. You should see every piece of feedback. You should see everyone who's listened to your record. And you should have that in detail. I think that's what people pay me for in, in many ways. Obviously, they pay for my contacts and my work and my time. But they also, I, I, even, if you, even if it doesn't work out, even if you end up working with other people or whatever, I think that kind of transparency is really important in our industry and isn't like taken care of enough. So essentially, the tailored website, the front end, where you can see lovely Cormac and his dog, Betty, um, it's, uh, it kind of operates like a magazine in a way. And we curate our roster very carefully. We are very careful in the planning and the kind of people that we work with and also the, the kind of press that we want to achieve. So it, I think it's important to show what we've done so that you know that we actually work. Um, and, um, and that's one thing. And then on the right-hand side, you can see like one of our reports, only a little bit of it. Um, but that's the kind of like layers of transparency that we give people. And actually, if that was live, you could see, you could go to stream only and you could see every single person who listened to the record. Mm -hmm. um, our back end is now done by Fat Drop because it just became so expensive to maintain my own system. Um, so I work with them as do lots of people in the industry, and we'll get onto that later. Um, what's the other thing I want to say? Oh yeah, so we also only, <laughs> we only work four days a week, or I only work four days a week, because all of us at Tailored are also part-time artists of some description. So uh, Marco, who does our accounts, uh, is a composer and runs a studio and is a live performer. Adam was performing in Porto last night, actually. Uh, yeah, he's a class classically uh, trained flautist. Um, and he, um, yeah, he's doing amazing stuff. Um, Cassia, who uh, is the most recent recruit, she's an amazing DJ from Croatia, just like on the start of her journey. And I make ceramics. <laughs> I also have two kids. Um, so yeah, so we, we do a lot, but we also kind of understand artists in lots of ways. We've had labels, we've recorded, we've performed. Um, and so I think that also gives us quite an interesting perspective on things because um, we've all been on like artistic chosen journeys in some way or another. 
So I want to kind of go back. So this page. Um, my primary focus right now is artist promotion. Um, I don't really... Uh, I kind of send out a lot of remixes to the record pool and then the rest of my time is really engaged with like my core artists. Um, and you can see some of them here. So there's the lovely Cormac, Jacko Jacko, Mary Ocher, Ellen Alien, Octave One, Richie Culver and Delilah Holiday, who are like the main people that I'm working with at the moment. Um, and all of that kind of work is focused on storytelling. And really, so, I mean, they're, you can t see they're all completely different music, um, <laughs> demographics, different stages of their careers, like, and that kind of doesn't matter. What matters is that I care about the music and I care about them, that I understand where they're coming from. Um, and th this isn't actually all of my artists roster right now. I, I also have Chris Corder and um, uh, Laura Mish I've just taken on as well. So there's, there's a lot going on there. Um, but what I kind of focus on with them is like storytelling and bigger key pieces and really like planning ahead, um, making sure that we do things at the right time, saying no to a lot of opportunities which don't make sense to do at that time. And I think that's what you get when you work with a PR agency, which you don't get when you're on your own. When you're on your own, it can be like, oh my God, someone's interested in me. We have to do it now. But actually sometimes it's like, well, if you do this, you can never do anything with that magazine ever again. Is that the right piece? Is it the right time? Is it tied into something? What happens if you then go and make an album and you've done everything already? So that's one of the things I do, I do with them. Um, and a lot of very detailed pitching um, around their ideas, around them as artists, around different concepts that are working on, albums, art shows, whatever it is. Um, and we're going to get onto pitching in the second part if we want to go that deep this is going to be your choice. <laughs> um, so this is just kind of like an example of a recent press campaign that we've done for an album, which was Two Sings album on Pan Records. Um, it was, it's a great album and he's a really interesting performer in person and so that there was a lot of interest there already. Um, but you can see like that it's quite a broad range of things from like a pitchfork review to an interview in Taz to an RA exchange, um, video premiere with fact. Uh, don't know what that is on the left there. Oh, I think that's dazed. Yeah, that's dazed. Uh, Metal magazine. So there were, it was like there were a lot of good reviews from very, very broad like newspapers and stuff as well. And lots of good interviews. This, if I could make every campaign like, look like this, I would be the happiest person on the planet. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, but yeah, so I hope that kind of like explains a little bit about who we are and what we do. Do you have any initial questions? Because I feel like we're quite a small group. So if you wanted to ask questions, you can just go ahead and ask them. And we'll we, be just, fine. we just have one from the streaming. From yeah. Sophia Mark asking if she that saying sounds amazing. Can I work for you too? <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, no, because four is enough. <laughs> um, yeah, we get we get asked a lot if people can come and work with us, and I do sometimes train uh, people through the Erasmus program. So if actually Cassia came to us, she's the last. She came through Erasmus, and um, I really like that program. And I've also like told a lot of people that I work with in different agencies that they should sign up to it as well. Um, because uh, they, if you don't know about Erasmus, it's basically for people aged up to 30 in the EU and they basically support you. Um, it's, I think it's the one that we do is um, Erasmus on, uh, Young Entrepreneurs and they essentially, they pay you to go into a company. You have to write um, a business proposal. Um, and then you have to find companies that like fit your proposal. Then you have to present it to them. And then we have to agree to help you um, basically to start your business or advise you in it. Um, so that was Cassia's idea. She was going to go back to Croatia and um, start her own PR firm. Unfortunately, the pandemic hit 
and um, it wasn't viable and so we kept her <laughs> and now she's mine <laughs> um, yeah and it's been but I've, I've trained I think eight people through that program and some of them actually some have started websites um, lots of people have gone on to do other things the, there were quite a few from the UK and it's no longer open to people in the UK thanks Brexit um, but if you have an Irish passport, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so what does the music press look like? Um, basically, there is a magazine for anything you could possibly ever want, and that's the same for music. Um, so the print landscape has obviously changed a lot in recent years. Advertising is down, paper is expensive. Um, Sending magazines around the world doesn't make as much financial sense as sending records around the world. Um, so things have changed quite a lot. What's still um, going tend to be the ones that I care about the most um, tend to be like the very good music magazines, things like The Wire, Gonzo Circus in the Netherlands, which is a really long running one. They also have a really beautiful CD that they still do. Um, Sugi DJ Mag comes in various forms around the world. One thing we can say about that is some of the DJ Mag front covers are paid for. Um, Neural, which is a very good like arts, culture, music magazine from Italy, things like Jazzwise. Um, Enemy actually I think is only online, I don't know why that's there. Um, Rolling Stone also has incarnations pretty much everywhere. Um, Mojo, these kinds of things. Then we have newspapers. Um, I don't work with certain newspapers <laughs> um, because I don't align with them. Um, but things like New York Times, Taz, Guardian, um, <laughs> Haaretz in Israel, um, lots of like really good newspapers all over the Mediterranean. There's lots that we can engage with with music. Um, some are more open to independent music than others. Um, then you've got your lifestyle and culture, things like Days, Big Issue, GQ, T-Mag from Italy, um, NR, which is also based in Italy now, um, all your normal fashion titles. These tend to you know, not be monthly. They tend to be something that maybe comes out biannually. Um, but the good thing about those is if you can get in one of those, you will be in someone's toilet for the next 10 years. Um, so, you know... <laughs> This is longevity. <laughs> um, same with these art magazines, freeze. You know, the, the good thing about print is it stays around. Not so much the newspapers and stuff, but if you get into a really good magazine with a really good piece, that is worth doing because it will, it will live for a while, hopefully. Um, then there's a huge tech magazine market, which um, for bands and producers and composers is really important. Um, lots of geek magazines as well, like Sin Mag, these kinds of things. Um, and then there's like all your local weeklies. I'm sure you have one here. <laughs> I'm going to go and look for it tomorrow. Um, things like Ex Berliner, which is based in, in Berlin, which is an English magazine. Um, you have all the queer magazines as well. S again, something like Butt is only four times a year, I think. Attitude is monthly. And then as independent music, we can engage with like mainstream titles. There's always a way into Grazia, I find. Um, and magazines like that, like these women's magazines, they will, they will cover stuff if you can sell it to them in the right way, if it makes sense. Um, whether it's like a travel feature or a food feature or whatever, it doesn't always have to be straight music. Like one of the <laughs> things with PR is trying to be creative about how you can get in somewhere by, um, by not necessarily just talking about music. Um, online is obviously the biggest space for music. Um, and the one thing I would say about that is there can't be that many readers for the amount of magazines <laughs> that there are. Like, there's not enough time in the day for all of these people to be reading all of these things. So... I think you have to be a little bit careful about what you do, um, especially if you're going to do your own own PR. Like, it do maybe doesn't make sense to do a lot of things because if some only three people are going to read it, especially if you're not comfortable with it or it's like a playlist or whatever, I think 
you really have to be a, a bit careful with some things. Um, so yeah, that's the one thing I'd say. The biggest ones um, for the kind of music that I'm working with is obviously like Resident Advisor, Crack, Pitchfork, Quietus, things like post-punk and pan-African music work with a lot of our artists. Um, and yeah, there's a huge amount. I don't think you probably need me to go through all of them. You kind of know, you know a lot of this stuff, I'm guessing. Um, so what I'll do is I'll skip to the end. So podcasts, I actually think are really valuable and I'm there's a lot of good music podcasts there's also a lot of great cultural podcasts uh, like special interest things um industry tech I think that if you can do something like that with a good journalist these are also really worth doing because people love podcasts you can listen to them anywhere and it's another thing like the more culture magazines that stick around for longer because people can go back to them in a way that they don't with a website because websites that are just churning out news pieces you just get lost it's there and in two days it's gone um, the other thing is now we have a lot of newsletters and things like Substack um, a lot of good journalists, music journalists, who during the pandemic or during the decline of advertising kind of look for new ways of um, being free and expressing themselves, covering more music that they like, um, covering it without being told what to write about. And a lot of them have started newsletters and there's every kind of newsletter. And it's worth looking at these as well. Um, radio. So radio was not sexy for a really long time. And then it kind of just resurged a little bit. And part of that is because of the digital, um, digital radio, um, more stations being added. And yeah, I, I'm, I still love radio. Um, so there's obviously your national radio, which is really important um, for exposure, but also payment. Um, there's local radio and as, I mean, there's college radio, which kind of functions like lo local radio does in the UK. Um, digital radio, everything from like NTS, which is kind of very cool, um, to Apple Beats, which is hit and miss. Also, I have to, one thing I would say about that is I think that their programming is very good, but I really wonder about like who's listening. Um, so yeah. Uh, I really like online community radio. I think it's really important to support. Again, the listenership might not be that high, but the freedom you get as an artist and the fact that you're supporting a lot of um, community-based projects, a lot of these um, things like Refuge, they're doing huge amounts to support their community. And in that way, I think it's really good for us as artists to kind of work with these people. Um, college radio, I've mentioned. Um, and then we have things like live streaming, which is great and also the bane of my life. Um, so that kind of goes from things like Core Radio and Boiler Room. And then you have like bigger things like Art of Concert, um, which is like massive productions, festivals, TV shows, this kind of thing. Um, there's also Colours, which I don't know if you guys know. I'm going to show you something about that later, I think, um, which is like single performances, which are really beautiful. Um, and there's all kinds of ways you can engage with that. And it's important as performers, I guess. Are you cold? <laughs> OK, I'm really hot. Um, and then there's TV. There's lots of like cultural programming on TV. So, so when I talked before, I basically said that I'm I'm focused more on storytelling, like bigger features, this kind of thing. So um, from a purely electronic music perspective and from the way that I do things, we kind of like resurrected the record pool, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with. So back in the day, um, um, they used to be these record pools that literally DJs would be signed up to radio shows and they would get sent white, uh, white labels. And this is when we could afford to do it. And they were maybe sending 200 to 1,000 white labels, depending on people's budget. So essentially, what we decided to do as a way to support DJs and young producers and people who don't necessarily have a lot to say but are just making great music, um, we kind of resurrected the record pool as a way of giving them a cheaper way of getting their music out there. So the focus for that is DJ Club Promo. 
um, sending to key radio shows that play dance music primarily, um, sending to key dance reviewers and people who do premieres, people to include in mixes, and then the, what, what that does is basically get key feedback for distribution. And the distribution now, their key function is pitching to DSPs, <laughs> to Spotify, Amazon, like there's very, like the actual record distribution part of distribution is much smaller than it used to be. And the way that, that um, most of the distributors are staying relevant uh, is to get you on playlists. Um, and so that feedback basically functions for them to do that. Um, yeah, so I wanted to just say a little bit about some things that people talk about. We've, we've lost a lot of good magazines recently, um, sometimes brutally. Um, we've also, like, the, the thing that I have to navigate a lot and which kind of makes your, the job really complicated Basically, I'm only as good as my contact list. Um, and if I don't have a good contact list, if I don't have good relationships with people, then I'm kind of useless in my job, even if I'm good at pitching, if I can't get to those people. And it's really difficult right now because everything is changing. People are leaving, like people aren't able to pay their way as journalists. I have a huge amount of respect for journalists and magazines that are still doing what they're doing because it's hard out there. Um, so in the last kind of two months, we lost Paper Magazine, which was a huge, long-running US ma culture magazine. We lost Galdem, which is was like specialist UK-based um, media focused on on women and people of colour. We lost well, Vice is a whole other story. AquaMB, which was another amazing cultural website, just closed down last week. Freund von Freund went bankrupt last week, and NPR, the entire editorial staff was laid off like a month ago with no warning. So <laughs> please let us respect the journalists who are still doing it because it's fucking precarious out there. Um, that then brings me on to paid for press, which um, I used to say was not a thing, but now I know that that's a lie. Um, so there. Real journalists and magazines, and I say like real, but um, more long-running ones, they're not going to be taking money for doing things. They just, it's like ethically, they just don't do that. Same with newspapers. Um, but there are a lot of like fashion magazines, cultural magazines, and some music magazines where you can buy the cover uh, or you can buy a press package and it is like this much editorial plus a shoot. Um, this kind of doesn't make them not, it kind of goes into the realm of like content creation, like content creation agencies. There's a lot of agencies that just do that straight up. They are making videos, they're, they're like creating content and, and they're creative agencies. They sometimes have magazines attached to them, and the magazine is part of that. Um, I've seen quotes for 40,000 euros for work with these, and I've also seen 500 euros. It really depends, <laughs> and I'm sure you can haggle. Um, and then there's the other thing, which is um, lots of paid for premieres. Um, these just tend to be admin fees, like, whether whether it's a good thing or not, I don't know. I give my clients the choice of whether they want to pay for something like that, whether they want to be aligned with that magazine, whether that cost is okay for them. But for the most cases, this is like 15 euros. The most I've ever seen is 600 euros, which was ludicrous. Um, but that was for a whole album. Um, the actual, then there's another wave of like paid for press, which is media partnerships. Um, Basically, event promotion, festival promotion, this basic, the only, the only press is media partnerships. And that tends to be, you buy advertising in the magazine, and in return, you, a journalist comes, you do pre, like pre-promo news, maybe some mixes, whatever it is, plus a review. Um, Personally, I think that the magazines are right to charge that. There's so many festivals. A lot of them have sponsors. 
most of them, unless they're like things like this or state sponsored or very specialist, those, you know, those I don't think should have to pay those things. And most of them don't, like most magazines are very flexible and understand that there's some things they want to support. And then sometimes if it's Live Nation, Live Nation should be paying for it, <laughs> sorry. So um, that's, yeah, that's kind of like the paid for press landscape, which um, a lot of people are confused about. Um, kind of going to videos and um, premieres and things, the one thing is that there's not like a single space where you can be guaranteed a lot of hits. Um, so I think this, a few years ago, everyone wanted like premieres for everything. Now it doesn't matter. Just get it out there with a, as many places as possible. Um, then I kind of want to, this idea of content, like your music is not content. It's your art. It's your work. Um, it's an expression of who you are. Content is something else. Content, when people talk about music as content, what they're doing is kind of devaluing it and it's a way for people to exploit it because they've taken it away from the thing that it, it actually is. Um, and I think it's really important as artists that you maintain control of your music, that you maintain control of your channels, that you don't give away um, the chance to monetize something even if it's a, a little thing on YouTube or um, on SoundCloud, whatever it is, you should have things on your own channels and people should repost from you. And if they don't want to do that, then I would expect at least that there's some kind of like editorial around it. So they would post your video and then they would do a feature with it. Because otherwise, I don't really see that as balanced. I see that as slightly exploitative. or well, very exploitative sometimes. Um, so, any questions? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so you would agree if you have some uh, content online that you haven't decided that should be online, like videos, for instance, like you just mentioned. That not, I can't that, hear you, sorry. Uh, is it on? It, it is on, but it's just for, ah, okay. uh, I guess, uh, <laughs> not amplified. Um, if you have your own contents on the internet mm -hmm. and you haven't decided that you wanted those contents on the internet, for instance, videos that were shot but you weren't asked for or authorization, stuff like that. Okay. Um, so you don't have a hold on them, they're just circulating. Yeah. And you think that you should take those videos out and that you choose what kind of videos you want to convey and uh, you would, so everything else that's gravitating around you and your image should just you should just get rid of no 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 i mean unless you're unhappy with it if it's something that you're not happy with then yes i think you should try and get it removed um but if it's just on other people's channels that you've worked with and stuff then actually that's good because that's building like a broader audience if you only have everything in one place then you're expecting to people to come and find you and you have to send them to you the yes it's important to have things and if you have something on someone else's channel you can mirror it for example on your youtube so you can make playlists with your things in other places so that it's on your channel as well but it might like the original place might be somewhere else um but yeah building an ecosystem is really important like having connections with other artists having your work in other places is is important it's as important as using every possible channel at your disposal you know which is something i want to talk about later which is you know having soundcloud having instagram like having every possible place that people can find you um within reason <laughs> but yeah no i would only do that if you're unhappy with something um yeah um any others um, well i have one about uh, media partnerships mm -hmm. that you have said so i've run into this a couple of times when um asking for a media partnership and then they get back and they say okay we can do this but uh, for this much mm -hmm. money and I've always been put off by it mm -hmm. because well who wants to pay right <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> I mean if we can get it for free <laughs> yeah, yeah but it's also have felt to me like the magazine's way of switching your media media partnership proposal to advertisement 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, essentially you... it is. That's that's what it is. It's an advertising, advertorial package. Um, is that for an, for an event? Uh, event, but also uh, album releases. Mm, yeah, I would never do it for an album release. Mm. Um, Unless it's like the greatest package yeah, ever. Yeah. Um, what were they offering? Uh, what were they offering like as an album kind of media partnership? I mean, I even this was not even so clear to me. Okay. It, I think I've, I've been uh, mostly proposing it at, at, hey, let's start a conversation. Should we do a media partnership? Okay. And then it's like, this is the fee for this. So yeah. this feels a bit shady, or it doesn't feel so yeah, it nice. Yeah, do doesn't. It's not very warm yeah. and fuzzy, is it? Um, yeah, I would. I don't think I would do that for um, for an album. I mean, I I recommend my artists to advertise in certain um, magazines for album releases, but that's like just a straight advert, and that's not necessarily like oh we've got a review there or we've got editorial there. It's just that I think musically your audience is there so mm -hmm. you should yeah. if you if you have a bit of budget because some of my artists they will get money like funding and things for that mm -hmm. um i work with a lot of artists who um m get money from like swedish government and these kinds of things who are very generous in scandinavia with uh, with uh, grants and stuff also um berlin music commission and this kind of thing and if they're when they're writing their grant proposals i'll some they'll come to me and ask about pr and and social media and I'll give them like an overview that they can use for their proposals and often I'll say and add in a thousand for like ad straight up advertising whether that's going to be street advertising or like advertising in the wire or, or Groove magazine or whatever it is um, sometimes they don't get the advertising part of the funding but it's worth asking um, yeah with the media partnerships I mean first off whatever somebody Asks, says is the price, like halve it and go back to them. Um, what I have noticed, and I don't think this is that great, but I've noticed that like festivals that I have worked with, they've been proposed much higher rates than I have for the same people for the same thing. So I do tend to like, if I'm working with someone, I'm like, please leave it, I'm gonna negotiate because I think that the magazines know that I know the rates because I've seen it more times. Um, it's the main reason why I hate event and festival promotion. I don't like having to do it. I didn't, like that's not that's not why I got into PR and music to like haggle over over like money and and how many adverts and how many banners and how long the banner will be up for. It's like not not exactly exciting stuff. Does that help at yeah, all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. thank you. And I, I, and I really think, like most of us, if it, like when something like that happens, most mm. of us have people in our community that we can ask about that. And um, I, yeah, I think it's important for us t as artists, events, label owners, um, PR companies, like to talk mm. and to share information and knowledge. Um, uh, because that's how we all get better deals and learn and and actually democratize things a lot more um, which I think is is important because it's you know it's easy to get taken advantage of but also you have to know what your budget is like and don't overdo your budget if you really can't afford something like that then you just have to believe that you'll find it somewhere else um, and obviously there are media partnerships that have value because those magazines are well read when you get a much smaller website or something asking for a media partnership for the same cost as maybe, you know, a crack magazine or RA or The Wire would ask for a media partnership, like, it's obviously not worth it because their readership isn't there. So you have to consider, like, their audience as well as yours and your budget. Additional question to mm -hmm. that. Do you suggest that it's better sometimes to... If, if one has a budget for mm -hmm. this specifically, would it make even more sense to approach the platforms with advertisement proposals? Or is it still better to uh, target it as a media partnership? I mean, I think a media partnership is better because like, I have an ad blocker, so I'm not going to see it. Mm -hmm. 
If I go on those sites, I won't see it. But if you do media partnership, then you have a review, you have a news piece. And like, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It could just be a news piece and a review. This, the, most of these, these sites for events and stuff, they have packages that are like start small and go really big, depending on your budget and stuff. Um, so yeah, I just think you have to know what you can afford and what you want and then negotiate with them. And most of these people are lovely and they're happy to support independent people and it's just like getting over the queasiness <laughs> a little bit. Um, Thank you. No, you're welcome. Um, so who does PR? Everybody. Um, literally everybody does PR. Um, if you send out a newsletter, if, you, if your agency sends out a, a, like an email saying who's on their roster, um, Distributors, record shops, Warp does it through Bleep. Um, there's basically, there's PR and marketing departments in every part of the music industry. Um, so there's communication agencies like us, there's social media management, um, which is obviously specialised, digital marketing agencies. There's now things like these submit platforms like Pitch um, and Submit Hub. Uh, Subhub? Submit? Whatever. Uh, record labels, record shops, like record shops like Phonica, essentially their blog is their PR arm where they do mixes and playlists. Beatport have Beat Portal, Bandcamp has Bandcamp Daily. Like these are editorial PR communication functions. Um, it's not a mystery, we're all doing it. Um, so the biggest thing with, with deciding on whether you want to work with a PR company is obviously the cost. But um, the thing with like working with a company like me, instead of um, like the way that I choose people that I work with is, um, do I like the music, <laughs> essentially? Um, I'm not worried about whether someone's going to sell a lot of records. I'm not worried about if someone's going to like, make me a lot of money because I get a flat fee. That's never going to happen. Um, that's a completely different consideration of a booking agency, a record label, a distributor. They are all, they have a different way of evaluating whether working with an artist is beneficial to them. Um, so most publicists are like that. Maybe not at like the big EDM or pop agencies, maybe they have a different criteria. Um, one of the reasons why I think PR is valuable is actually to get people outside of their bubble. Um, it's really, really hard to get outside your bubble sometimes, even if you have the most amazing community and the most amazing music. This is you know, one of the reasons why we've not seen enough international music and why so much um, music is based on like European music, because we're the ones doing all the communicating. and. Um, yeah, so that's that's something that has changed a lot recently. Um, and the other thing is, I just think that for artists, not every artist can do their own PR. I think it's really hard to be creative and wear all the other hats that you're expected to do, from your own accounting to, um, yeah, to making music, to posting, to communicating. Like, it's just, it's too much for some people. And so I think that we also have to respect the fact that some of the functions, like the industry functions and jobs, they're there for a reason, and that's to enable artists to be artists. Um, the other thing that I do, aside from the planning and the preparation, is like just support artists and make sure that they don't get into trouble um, and that things run smoothly and everyone's happy. Um, so this is like, kind of an overview of, of some of the different ways and platforms. So I don't know if any of you have used any of these platforms like Pitch, um, Pitch and Submit Hub. Yeah? How were they? <laughs> was, it, was it a good experience? Like, was it valuable? Sure, go for it. I've used Submit Hub. OK. And it's. It's pretty good, mostly like yeah. what genuine. What kind of music for? Uh, so I make uh, ambient electronic, mm -hmm. experimental, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I think 
obviously your result will vary your experience i mean the experience was almost the same but the result varies with every release okay. because some releases uh, it's very it's very subjective which playlisters you pitch to and which one will pick the track up and put so it in the playlist so you can choose them you can choose who you send it to and yes. then they decide whether they yeah. listen or not so on on the interface you just uh, you upload your track and mm -hmm. uh, give the link on the i usually do this on the release date mm -hmm. and uh, they'll give you uh, they'll give you the perfect match the pr oh, the in, it'll say nice. that like okay uh, and they'll they'll usually go by genre that mm -hmm. if you pitch to this playlister then he he or she usually accepts this kind of music and uh, and so if you follow that usually it will be unless it's some it's if you're like if you've mentioned incorrect genres in your music then it will be then it goes uh, on. yeah okay. and what kind of results do you see from that uh so so um so for two of my songs i mean not actually one of my songs i think it got uh, picked up by a, a by a spotify editorial uh, mm -hmm. playlist like a big one okay great and uh, i think this is and i'm not sure whether this was the reason but i think it happened because it was already in a lot of independent playlists okay yeah and the way to independent playlists is usually through these kind of platforms okay yeah and okay. then so basically the algorithm just maybe senses that okay you've already made it to these independent playlists which are already quite big yeah. and then the edit you just get i, I don't know okay and you just are you self releasing yeah okay yeah all right so that's interesting. So you're primarily using it for playlisting, not yeah. for editorial reviews uh, I've or tried radio? The, I've actually, oh yeah, so I forgot. I've tried it for the, uh, there's, there's a section where you can send it to uh, influencers and bloggers as well. Okay. So I have sent it to bloggers and I've had one or two songs. Uh, but then some of those blogs are like, uh, you get, they, they say, that, hey, we like your music, amazing, amazing, but this is the fee for yeah, writing okay. about it and then and I'm like... And you've already paid a fee with Submit Hub, To yeah, submit it, for yes. For them to listen. To like, uh, like, it's like, when you sub... Usually it's with within one, one, uh, two, two and a half, three dollars. Like, okay. to sub... Uh, depends on how, yeah. Do you mind me asking, like, it in total, like, how much, like, doing one track through that would cost, roughly? Uh, Just to work out my prices. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, I, I don't mind disclosing that. And I think it's very useful yeah. because... What you gain out of this is always better than that. Whatever you spend, it's been, um, I'll have to calculate because I'm thinking in Indian rupees right now. Uh, not more than, uh, not more than, w e even if you were to really exhaust which playlisters you're sending it yeah. to, not more than 150 euros for a release. Okay, that's fine. And, and because if you land up on some big playlist, this, the, what you're going to get because of the streams is going to be just streams yeah, yeah. is going to be maybe more yeah. than that like okay. over the course of a year or something so. okay because i guess the equivalent is so there are pr companies who offer like playlist pitching um and i've heard of them charging like a thousand euros for that which and is just not worth i like submit i'm sorry yeah i like <laughs> submit her because they actually are uh, they they don't charge they don't say that oh you pay this and you're going to land up in the playlist they say that yeah. you pay this to to get to just the get the person listen to your music yeah. and if they like it then they'll put it in the playlist if they yeah. don't then you still have paid them that yeah i think uh, it's okay as well like when they first came out i was like this is disgusting but actually i mean this it serves a function and especially with playlisting and stuff you know yes that's we hit a lot of playlists but that's never going to be my pr agency's primary function um, just because it's not enough hours in the day, quite frankly. Um, and I think you have to have, you have, I have good relationships with like the different main editors at these places, but that doesn't mean that I can hit every playlist, like some editorial, but there's so many people working at these companies and so many different playlists. Plus there's all the media playlists and stuff. Okay, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm happy to have like, <laughs> that you've shared that positive experience no with me. That's good. Okay, so there's, there's things like that. There's the pitch platforms, which I think if you're doing your own PR is a perfectly viable way of doing it. Have you ever used pitch anyone? 
because that one seems to me a bit more specific and it says that they curate their roster and everything. It also looks good and I guess if the price is right, why not? Um, there's also, I mean, you don't have to use any of these things. You can just like use your socials and your websites to market directly to your fans if you have a big enough fan base. And even if you don't, like the function of working with that will grow your fan base. Um, what I would say about those, and maybe I've got a, yeah, okay, so I'm gonna move on. <laughs> so, um, what I wanna talk about is like, if you wanna work with a PR agency, um, at what point do you know that you're ready to do that? Like not, if people come to me and I think they're not ready, I'll tell them. I don't know if that's the case for other people. So I think it's important that you as artists know where you are and if it's worth investing um and the main thing is like do you actually have something to communicate because if you want to go for full press campaigns you actually like there has to be a lot of substance behind it so i don't necessarily think that people who are just making dance tracks or are very early in their career need pr it might be useful to have it on like a certain record because then you know working with someone like me who I can help plan and ideas and stuff. And then you do that one campaign and then maybe you don't work with someone for another two years and you do it yourself or you do it with the record labels that you're working with or your booker or whatever. Um, so just because you take PR doesn't mean you have to carry on doing it. Like, I think it should be quite a fluid thing. Um, you need, yeah, you just need things to communicate to the press and you need to have a hook and you need to have like actual substance because otherwise it's just gonna be like puff basically. Um, I also think if you're getting already people interested in coming to you, um, like if you've had interest from press, if you're gaining a bit of attention, that that can also be a signal. If you feel you're not able to cope with that or you wanna do something more, that it might be an idea to work with an agency. Um, but the thing you have to remember is, you actually don't pay me for results. You pay me for my work and my time, and this is the case with every PR agency. So if you're not financially able to invest, I really wouldn't. Like I would, and if, um, if say you're working with a booking agency or a record label, and they really want you to take PR and you kind of can't financially afford it, they should take some of that burden, if not all of it. Um, I've heard absolute horror stories from artists who have worked with um, certain, <laughs> certain labels. One of my artists ended up owing 20,000 euros because they insisted that he get PR in five different territories. It was a huge amount of money and I swear to God he got four pieces of press out of it. Um, and this is absolutely, this is like the worst case horror story, but he should never have been put in that position. And unfortunately, he didn't have anyone to advocate for him. And he was taken advantage of by a very large company. <laughs> um, so there's that, choosing the right agency, not getting taken advantage of, and um, yeah, just really understanding what you can get out of it and making smart decisions um, and making smart decisions like the number one red flag about working with anyone in the music industry PR management booking have they actually listened to your music do they like what you do um, I'm amazed by how many people email me asking me to work with them and don't actually send me their music like well what are we doing here? <laughs> like, you'll send a photo of yourself, but you won't send your music? Come on, guys. Um, so if that happens, and so if you forget to put the links in, and they're like, yes, it's going to be 500 euros, run a mile. Um, you should be working with people. It sounds so basic, doesn't it? But it's, I, it's genuinely true. Um, look at their roster. Like, are there other artists that you like? Um, musically, does it make sense? Um, I actually had a conversation with one of my artists yesterday who was worried that, that he's too similar to another artist on my roster. He's not. Um, but PR, it's actually an advantage 
to have artists who are similar because then people understand that they can come to me for a certain kind of sound or certain political leanings or you know when you when you group artists together it's not necessarily a disadvantage um so i think it's good to look for agencies where you fit in their roster musically um when you speak to the people do they actually engage with you <laughs> or do they just tell you what the price is because if with my record pool i'm a bit like this is the price this is what we do but if i'm talking to someone about a full campaign like the first thing to discuss is like, what do you actually want to achieve? Like, can you send me the concept? Like, do you have a timeline? Are you doing events? Like, I, I need more information. If people aren't looking for that information from you, then I, I don't think that that's a particularly good sign of, of like a working relationship. Mm. You want to ask a question? <laughs> well, I see there's a question in the chat. You, do you okay. want us to wait yeah, yeah. after or not? If it's, yeah, go for it. Okay, well, we have a question from Sofia Marquez. Mm -hmm. What do you feel is the main outcome an artist can get with PR? I've worked with PR for my latest record, but I feel I didn't have a direct impact on audience growth. At the same time, I feel like my current audience feels like I'm bigger. Ah, at the same time, I feel like my current audience feels like I'm bigger than I actually am. This mismatch is hurting my career somehow. Mm. I mean, that's a difficult question. Um, I mean, PR isn't necessarily about selling records, but I also don't know what kind of PR campaign she's done. So it's a bit hard for me to answer it. Like if she's really done like a full press campaign where she's been pitched to all of the major magazines, where she's had video or, or different kinds of, of um, things to stream, then it, I, I would have expected some impact. Sales is one thing, but actual like um, like visual recognition of your name or your image is like the biggest thing that PR will do. And, and one of those things is when people read your story or, or see you in lots of different places, that recognition like leads to growth. Either somebody sees something exciting about you and follows you on social media, but that's not real. Like people following you on social media isn't real. What's real? Like actual true value as an artist is, are they going to your show? Are they buying your record? Are they streaming your record? Um, are they buying your t-shirt if you make t-shirts? Like that's actual engagement. People like liking you or following you on social media. It's not real, it's like half of them are bots. Mm -hmm. So I think that the way we think of ourselves as artists has to be based on like true value. Um, so yeah, it's it's hard for me. She, she can email me. <laughs> yeah, she said, uh, we'll come home also saying full press campaign, radio magazines, others. Um, international. International. Oh, okay. Like um, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to take a look at the press report and advise her. Um, it's very hard for me to talk about other people's work. Um. And also, if I haven't heard the music and I don't know the artist, it's also hard for me to say, like, what, what could be good? Like, what kind of magazines do you appeal to? If you're making some very specific type of music, it, you know, you only have a certain part of, of the whole media landscape that's going to fit for you in, in many cases. And not everyone can get Pitchfork. Like, not everyone can get Bangkamp Daily. Like, and these, like, very, um, like, the, the more high quality things. And like something like Bandcamp Daily does actually have a knock-on effect to sales. Um, that's not the case with a lot of press. Genuinely, it's not. It's about recognition. It's about building your story. And, and honestly, like good press, like really good editorial press, the reason why I, I care about it and I do it is because as artists, you are going to have moments when your career is great and you're going to have a shit tongue when they're not because that's the nature of creativity in music you can't be what people want all the time because trends change people's tastes change i've been in this 25 years if like everything goes in seven year cycles like i've seen this people's taste come and go and come and go and you know, I thought breakbeat and drum and bass weren't going to come back. <laughs> I was wrong. I thought garage wasn't going to come back. 
who's a happy girl now? Um, you know, and I've had to spend, endure years of listening to very straight white techno because that's what people <laughs> were interested in. But it changes, and that's one of, the, one of the reasons why I have a problem with this Lismus thing. So at the end of every year, the magazines, like particularly websites, put, pull together these top 10s, top 100s, whatever. Put everyone in a list. Like, honestly, in my youth, like being on a list would have been the death of cool. <laughs> but like, the last 10 years, everyone seems really enthusiastic. What happens if you're in the top 10 of the list and then you're the top 10 and suddenly you're top 50 and then you're number 79 and then you're nowhere? Like, the mentally, artists have to deal with this. And that, if, you, if you're living in a system where capitalism is reigning and lots of big companies and lazy promoters or whatever are literally looking for the top 100 and just, like, booking the top 20, and you can look at festivals and that's what they're doing, what happens to your career? Like, how do you get over this as an artist when you're not, you're not in that anymore? Like, there has to be a way for artists to exist outside of this popularity contest because it's fucking art. It's not a popularity contest. And so that's why I think storytelling is important. That's why I think supporting good magazines, good community radio is important because that's where we get our base from. That's where we get our roots. And that's where we will achieve longevity for people who want to have sustainable careers. And a sustainable career isn't being at the top all the time. It's being able to make a living, making great art. Maybe you're a physiotherapist on the side. That's OK. Like, having a day job is nothing to be ashamed of as an artist. But being who you want to be is really important, I think. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. Um, OK. Um, so yeah. What's the, I'm now going to do a little pros and cons, and then we're going to take a break, because there's some very tired looking faces, <laughs> including mine. OK, so pros of working with an agency. Um, yeah, strategy and planning, someone like me running their mouth off the whole time, uh, plugging into an existing contact and knowledge database, um, being presented alongside artists that make sense, you know, so that people can kind of get what you're doing. It's an investment. And sometimes investing in yourself is a really good thing. We like to call it self-care and wellness these days. Um, help in presenting yourself. Not everyone's a great communicator. Not everyone's a great writer. Maybe you don't know like just the basics of like how to do a press shot. Even working with a PR, like a good PR company one time on something can have a knock-on effect that you can do other things on your own after. You don't have to invest all the time. Um, Certain artists need a team, certain labels need a team, and PR is an important part of that. So is having a lawyer, by the way. Um, <laughs> read your contracts. Um, protecting you from shitty situations. Um, yeah, that's, that's always good. Hopefully, you don't have to navigate the process. Um, and just having someone who can support you and advocate for you. Um, I mean, when you work with an independent PR agency like me, obviously I do PR, but I do other things as well. And that's really beneficial for people who don't have bigger support networks, who don't really understand the industry or something. Sometimes that's, that can be really helpful. Um, what's the cons? Financial burden versus reward. There is no guarantee. I cannot force a journalist to write about something. I can't even force them to listen to your record. <laughs> I, what I can do is choose carefully, um, offer music in the best way that I can, follow up with people, do my job. But at the end of the day, it's their choice. <laughs> They're free agents. So what you are not paying for in PR is results, unfortunately. Um, but. If I'm doing my job, then I'm also not going to take on things that I don't think I can do a good job with. Like, it doesn't serve me to work with artists and take their money knowing that I won't get any results, because that's just going to ruin my reputation as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's no guarantees. And you have to, once you agree to work with anyone, management, publishing company, label, you have to manage the relationship as well. You can't just check out. 
you have to communicate, you have to give people stuff to work with. Um, I'm amazed sometimes that people are like, oh, it's not really working. Like, and then something will happen, and I'll be like, but you didn't, you didn't tell me. Like, I'm not a mind reader, tell me. Tell me two weeks before, and that's the same with, with anyone. Um, make sure you set your boundaries, your expectations, have a clear timeline, targets. Um, I think it's, you should have a plan. The plan may change, but like to start with a framework, and that's just good communication. Um, and don't allow other people to communicate for you. Maybe they take the brunt of it, like if you have a manager or a booker or something, but at least have one good conversation with the agency and the PR so that they know you, so that they can ask questions directly. It really frustrates me when people are like filtered all the time. Um, so what would it look like doing your own PR? Um, building your own network relationships, contact lists, it's hugely valuable. Um, and that's something that then if you choose to work with an agency, they build on. If they're only going to take your contact list, then that makes no sense at all. They should be adding to it. They should be taking you out of your bubble. Um, you understand where your place in it, <laughs> whether that's a good thing. It might be depressing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, the music industry is a fickle beast. Um, investing in your own systems, building your own channels, this is something I think you should be doing anyway. I don't think you should let other people do that for you. Um, understanding what's achievable and, and realistic. Um, and you have money then to buy synthesizers. Um, but the biggest problem is the time. It's a very, very, very time intensive thing doing PR. That's, I guess, why so many agencies exist. Um, finding the contacts, reaching out to people, doing pitches, communicating, uploading, managing all the channels. It's a lot. Um, if you're not a good writer, then that can be difficult. But honestly, ChatGPT is your friend. Um, you can... <laughs> I've tried it for press releases, it's horrible, but I'm pretty sure if you just put the notes in, you can get something that's pretty passable, um, especially for like a single record release, whatever. Um, it can be expensive. Like I, a lot of my overheads are things like file storage, um, file delivery and all this kind of thing. Um, but it's also maybe worth it, especially if you're a record label. Um, not having protection, advice, community, planning, um, and a wider network. Um, and then, yeah, just having to wear all the hats. But there's no reason why you can't do it if you want to. And that's part two. <laughs> do you have any questions now? Am I talking too fast? <laughs> OK, good. So just to get my things in order, so there are uh, PR, but apart from uh, like independent, no? Uh, independent or uh, what do you uh, mean? An organization that, that only does PR. Yes, I own. Yeah, you only do that. Well, I do PR management and, and uh, yeah, PR management. Okay. But yeah, so there's lots. So uh, like a, a label could speak to you to do PR. Yes. Or you could also work inside a label? Yes. OK. Oof. Or a marketing company <laughs> or, yeah. It's all, it's all new oh, to Oh, yeah. Me. Like, some of the biggest PR departments in the world are in, in record labels. Of course. OK, yeah. OK. Um, like working in a bank. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> the question is of, of <laughs> should we take a Should we take a quick break? Yeah, just a uh, Quick comment sure. that you were you were talking about the the pro the pros or and the cons of doing um, of doing uh, DIY PR. I think also one of the cons is also frustration. No, oh, like gotcha. uh, yes, which is something that uh, <coughs> also as an artist you you, you are uh, or as a level manager or, or what's not you you have to deal in a, in a lot of different levels. But that's just adding one more to it. So if you actually are working with someone to do it for you, you yeah. are kind of sharing this burden. Yeah. And it's something that... Um, it's hard to not take something personally when it's personal. <laughs> like, this is... That's the reality of being human. And I do think that that's one of the things, like, 
sometimes I take it really personally. Like, I fucking love this and you don't like it. I'm sure I've told Joan Slime, like, have you actually listened to it? <laughs> like, this is amazing. Um, clearly, we can't be friends anymore. Um, but uh, that's even worse if it's, like, your baby. It's your art. Like, uh, this is, yeah, this is a real thing. And, and I think that that's one of the things, like, if you're very sensitive <laughs> and if you're, like, easily depressed, if you're easily disillusioned, it's good to have people around you and to have this buffer that protects you. I also, that's one of the reasons why I worked, like consciously work with a lot of women and, and, and gay people and uh, transgender people because I think that they need the support of, pro of a professional um, because some of the pictures I get are really not okay. Um, and some of the questions people get asked in interviews are really not okay. And you need to have someone who can, like, the, you can call me after an interview and be like, actually, that was really awkward. Like, they asked this, and I'll be like, okay, fine, I'm going to sort it. And that's hard to do yourself because you feel awkward and you're like, oh, am I going to upset them? Is, am I ruin, ruining an opportunity? Like, what, what does this mean? Whereas that's like, me being polite and direct and knowing how to deal with that, that's my job. I should be able to deal with those problems in a way that nobody gets offended and everyone ends up happy, even if I have to be very like stern about things. And that happens more often than it should. Like, really, it happens a lot. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of my job, which I didn't realise in the beginning, is protecting people. Um, the music industry is full of sharks. Mean ones, big deep. Um, so yeah. Shall we break? Yeah, <laughs>
Okay, so um, I'm just going to pick on a couple of little things that actually we spoke about in the break a little bit, um, which is reports. Um, and from my perspective, I spoke about transparency and stuff. Um, I think that if you are paying for a service from a PR agency, you should have a report. And it should be clear, it should be delivered at the beginning of the campaign, it should be regularly updated, and you should have it to keep at the end with your clippings, with your radio plays. Like, that's what you're paying for as well. Like, even if it's a shit report, it's still your report. Um, I also think that if you work with management label booking agency and something is about you and you ask to be brought into the conversation, they should be willing to do that. Um, and I think that if you're cut out of communication, especially with management, people you don't know that well, like, I just think it's a red flag and you have every right to insist. Um, even if they won't CC, you, you should at least be shown what people are saying, especially if you have a concern around something. Um, the other thing's, okay, so the other thing is like <laughs> logins and passwords um, for your systems. Please, don't give them to other people. Even if other people set them up, you should have everything. Get one password, organize yourself, because this, this relationships break down. You will work over like a 15, 20 year career, you will work with so many different people. It's really important that you have control of, like I said, your systems, but also your passwords and logins. Um, it's, yeah. And then the paying for playlisting we kind of talked about already. Um, so, these are the stages of a press campaign. Um, this is how I do it. <laughs> and this is how you would do it if you're doing yourself so that you can be fairly comprehensive. So this is the planning and the prep stage where I'm having meetings with the client about the campaign, agreeing timeline, talking about targets, what we want to achieve, preparing all the assets, getting the music uploaded, writing press releases, getting biog, art, pictures, and then in my case, uploading it to my systems to start preparing. And also formulating the pitch, like what are the ideas? What do we want to talk about? Maybe there's just one central thing that we want to talk about. Maybe there's lots of different things, like if, if you know, there's art, there's performance, there's different facets of the work. Um, then there's the pre-promo stage, which is before I've announced anything, before the label's announced anything, the artist, um, where I'm reaching out to key editors maybe giving them music in advance, telling them the general idea. I might be sending the pitch already to like long lead magazines, um, but I might just be like giving them the music and giving them a longer time to engage with it because they're busy. Um, and yeah, maybe radio, online premieres, mixes, these kind of things kind of get booked up much further in advance. So if I have everything ready, it's a good idea to reach out earlier. Um, then the general promo will start, we'll do the announcement to the public. I will, in, in my case, I will open up the release to a much wider set of contacts. I will send out a blanket email to uh, like a big contact list where we call it shaking the tree, <laughs> where we see what falls out when you send the music. Um, people I hadn't thought of who would like the music or like the artist perhaps. Um, and that's when I send my first report to the client. Um, I send a live link where everything is there then from day one. They have one link, they can check it any time. Feedback, listens, it's all in there. My pictures are in there. If I followed up, I put the date that I followed up. Um, in, if I'm working with Adam and Cassia on something, it'll be like Cassia pitched, Melissa pitched. What did I pitch? Did I pitch about performance? Did I pitch a general mix? Like, whatever. Um, then I'll start following up. Um, following up to people I did the pre-promo with, more pitches, checking the report, seeing who's interested, following up with them, um, setting up the interviews then, um, shoots, features, checking who's going to actually do a review, checking for radio plays, all that kind of thing. And then once we have the results, getting those to the client so that they can use them, so that they can give it to their distributor, so they can use it on their socials. Um, that kind of thing. Um, and then the cost kind of thing we talked about a bit, so I, we can leave it, right? Okay, great. So, part two. <laughs> um, so yeah, kind of moving on from that then, what would you actually need to do your own PR? 
Um, you need to plan. You need to have a plan. The best place to start is the timeline, get your targets together and research who you're going to send it to. Um, get your emails and this kind of thing together. Putting together what you, how you want to present yourself, your electronic press kit, um, how you're going to get the music to people, what you're going to say in your pitch, um, and then getting together your assets, making sure that your socials are all looking nice and this kind of thing. Um, putting together the contacts, the main list, working out your deadlines, and then the actual action of doing it. Emailing your pitch, following up, getting results. So, the planning thing. It's really important to start with your timeline. It's just a way of organising how you're going to do things, um, and it just smooths things out. You can work with your booker, you can work with uh, your distributor, and it's this way you don't miss things. Even if you're only sending things to DSPs, like there's a timeline of when your distributor needs to pitch. There's a timeline of when you should be pitching it. And the more careful you are with your timeline, you have time to work, impact dates, and you can organize things around that. You can make sure that, like, oh, this, I've done this interview, and instead of them just randomly putting it out, you can say, could you put it out on this date because this is going to coincide with this single release? Like, just being organized, basically. Um, with your targets, you, do, you should be realistic. Um, if you've never got press before, you're probably not going to get Pitchfork the first time. Maybe you should like look for like smaller magazines that might be more open to new artists or just finding things that represent you and your music and are supportive of that. Um, so that comes down to the research part, <laughs> which is not to be overlooked. One thing I really recommend as artists is like reaching out to different PR agencies and asking to be put on their mailing list. Like a great way of seeing how PR is done is to be on the receiving end of it. And I pretty much everyone I know will put artists, promoters, labels, will put you on the mailing list. Like we're happy to do that. Um, it's not all for journalists. Um, and then the other thing is like, looking at all of the websites, go into the masthead, find out who the editor is. Maybe don't pitch to the top editor, look for the staff writer, look for the digital editor, start online before you go for print press, this kind of thing. Um, and then Twitter and Instagram are your friend. Um, lots of people can be found there. And the good thing is a lot of them are sharing their work, so you can actually listen to their show or read what they've written and get an idea of like what they're interested in. Most cases, it'll be football, um, especially on Twitter. It's like music journalist, football, Twitter is a real thing. Um, I'm like, oh, you didn't reply to my email, but you posted 17 times about like Arsenal. Um, so with the, your electronic press kit, so the way that I do it essentially on my site is every artist page, every release page is what you would call an electronic press kit. Biog, pictures, downloads, links to other press, links to all the socials, maybe there's like radio shows, streams, just like building the world. Um, don't, don't make it complicated, keep it short, keep it well structured. A short biog, a good press shot. One thing I would say is always credit photographers, writers, directors, creative teams, um, like in your press kit, but also online. Like when you post something on your social media, credit everyone, not only because it's polite and they did the work, but also because that's spreading the network. You post them, they're gonna post you as well. They have different followers. This is how we build interest and we build like an ecosystem. Um, with the music, I mean, depending on what it is, like the current release, maybe you can also give a future release. Um, recent mixes, radio shows, maybe but past release, but not everything. Like, they're not going to listen to it all. You have to learn to edit yourself, um, which is hard, I know, especially as artists and if you're really proud of things. But, like, you don't have to give things to people at once because, remember, you're going to follow up with them and you're maybe going to have a conversation with them. If you give everything to everyone all at once, then you've got nothing else to talk about. Like, 
you, if you start somewhere small and good, then the next it's, and now I've got this for you. Oh, you, you kind of like this, but not enough to write about it, but now I've got this for you. Like, this is how you build that understanding. Um, upcoming dates, performances, video, again, not 10, just two is fine. Maybe one music video, one live performance. Um, maybe some key press. I'm not the hugest fan of like these hypey quotes from other artists, quotes from other magazines. Like I don't really think it's it's a great thing to do, but a lot of people do it, especially bigger record labels like to do it. And I I guess, yeah, I, I, it's a personal choice, ultimately. I don't do it. Um, and then important links and contacts. That should be enough, maximum two pages. Ideally, one, but you know, if there's a lot to talk about. And yeah, just make it pretty, put it somewhere on the internet, and you can link to it. Whether that becomes your website page, a holding page somewhere, or I use it, like an agency uses it, your label, your booker, like that's, that's your electronic press kit. Um, there's a lot of options for giving people music. Um, don't use anything dodgy. And because people won't, like, they'll see it and they don't want to link to it. If you can, use something like SoundCloud or Disco. If you're a label or you have a bit of money to invest, something like Fat Drop, In Flight, Promo Jukebox are good because they also do reporting. Um, so you can kind of use that for your distribution, which especially if you're a record label and you're doing a few things, like even if you're a small record label, I think that's kind of a good investment. Um, and it's not that expensive. Um, for video, links people know. <laughs> you can do unlisted stuff so you can send it early. What I would say though is if you're sending video to someone and then you're going to premiere something, re-upload it because otherwise it could say that it's eight months old when actually you've only released it four hours ago. Um, when you send, embed the artwork, make sure the metadata is correct and you need your ISRC codes. That's how you get paid. So radio needs it. If you send something to radio and they don't have it, they probably won't play it because they, they rely on this information to automate and get people paid. Um, only send trusted links and yeah, edit yourself, pick the best. Um, and if you're not sure, maybe send it to friends and colleagues and ask them like, what do you think is the best? Like, do, does this look good? Like just, Ask for advice, basically, from your network. So writing a pitch. <laughs> this is something that I thought maybe we could do as a practical thing, but I, I think maybe we have to see if we have time. Um, but like a, a pitch is not like a very long thing. It's deciding on, it's your way of helping someone see who you are and decide if they want to cover you. So. It's not that a pitch is like a long essay, it's actually the opposite. It's a concise way of someone getting a snapshot of who you are. You can then link to your press release, you can link to your electronic press kit, but what you want to do is like give them a bite-sized idea. And then, so the way that I would do it, if I had somebody with an album that's also doing a performance like, so I would do like a very small paragraph on the artist and, and what this album is, and then I would do another paragraph on the exciting thing that I just want that journalist to know about. And I really, like, I keep it quite small. I don't know, maybe other people do it in a more involved way, but I would rather, like, just open the conversation and then come back in a week and be like, hey, did you listen? So now I'm going to give you more of the pitch. Like, the pitch doesn't have to be given all at once because people are busy. Get them interested. Maybe they're not interested, they'll tell you, or they'll just ignore you, more than likely. But you can then come back. And I think um, one of the, the, the important things of like getting people to understand and interested in writing is not to throw everything at them, but like give them little bits and then keep coming back. Because maybe the first three times you talk to someone about something, that it, there isn't something there for them. But then the fourth time, you come back to them with something and they're like, actually, that is interesting. And I kind of thought it was interesting before, but not so much. And it's like building that relationship and that understanding. 
Um, yeah, and I also don't like, conf uh, like sharing things that aren't confirmed. And again, that's because I want something that I can come back to them with. The only way I would do that is if I'm on a very short timeline and, or it's really, really exciting or I have to get someone to fly somewhere for something, then I might tell them about something unconfirmed just to prepare them. But I hate disappointing people, so maybe not. Um, and also, I think if you've taken your time to research properly, you should be able to kind of maybe suggest where you fit in a magazine like maybe you're not going after six pages in the front cover but maybe there's like a piece on the back cover where somebody talks about a certain subject or you know there's lots of magazines have set features within them little pieces one pages you could suggest yourself for that as like an opening point like oh i think i would fit with that or something i'm doing does like help help them to, to understand where you could be um yeah, the assets. <laughs> so your press release is important. Like I said, you can use ChatGPT, that's fine. Um, but I, I tend to go for like one big press release for the whole campaign and then I will take parts of it for doing like singles or different things. I like to have everything together. That's just because I'm a all my ducks in a row person. So, but you can handle it however you want. Your biography you also need to have like a short version and a long version especially if you're performing you know you don't want people like massacring your biog every time you get a show you should just be able to give them like five lines make sure that everything's nicely presented use things like linktree um you need to get your pre-sales pre-order sharing links all organized you can do that with your distributor that needs to be done like four to six weeks before something's coming out this is all part of the timeline. Press shots, artwork, videos, <laughs> music all organized. And also, like, what, what things are you doing in real life? Like, having an idea and a plan of those things as well. That's all considered assets, and all of that help you build a good campaign. Um, <laughs> contacts. Yes. So, um, I really think that the worst thing you could do is like take a blanket email list from someone and send your stuff out to a thousand people and just spam them basically. I know a lot of people do it because I'm on the receiving end of so many of these emails and I'm like, I'm not a journalist, I'm not a DJ, why are you sending me this? Um, and that just makes me know that this person just took an email list from somewhere. I swear 25, even 10 well-researched contacts will that you can write personally to that will actually understand your music. Maybe they don't get it the first time, but you can build a relationship with them. This is so much more valuable than blanket sending to a bunch of people in the music industry. Um, and yeah, I started tailored with 100 contacts. I had thousands of contacts from working at Fabric, but I took the ones that I knew were going to be people that I wanted to work with. And from there, I expanded and I've built relationships. And I just think that it's detrimental to just blanket send. I, I don't think it does any good. Um, yeah, I'm very much in favor of like careful, considerate contact research. And you can find people, Twitter, Bandcamp, you can follow. Like people have their, like what they're listening to, what they're buying. Lots of journalists have like open playlists and stuff. And you can really, this I think is really cool. Um, Instagram, Twitter and stuff, like these are your friends. It takes time, but it is worth doing if you seriously want to do DIY PR. Um, and then the other thing is just finding your deadlines. There's like some golden rules, which is like print maybe two to three months ahead. I think it's a bit less now, but I would try and pitch like that far in advance to give yourself the best chance. Um, digital magazines, again six weeks maybe four weeks three weeks but over some periods it's longer um and radio deadlines a few weeks dsp editorial deadlines three weeks for playlisting um for like pitching through their portals and stuff that was the one thing i noticed you told me that you used submit hub like on the day of release um for, for playlisting on, uh, yeah for playlisting on spotify because before that they can't uh, uh 
like the way the submit hub works is that like the moment your song is released and if you send it uh, okay. they'll take 48 hours to decide whether they want to put it in the playlist and they would oh, okay like it's, it you works. know that you can do it directly through your spotify artist though three weeks before right yes that's okay. a three week thing yeah, 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 yeah. okay cool. for play for editorial playlists yes okay cool yeah. so yeah there's different deadlines it just as part of your timeline it makes sense to also look at deadlines and stuff um Sending the pitch, I've kind of said how to do it already. Um, yeah, so we've already talked about that. Um, and then, like, use the stuff that you get. Share it. Share it with your network. Um, I'm always slightly amazed, like, how many people don't share the results that they get. Like, you'll say that a release is out, but, like, you don't share the reviews. You're not sharing the radio shows. Like... Once you have these these things that you've worked hard for, it's not easy to get press. It's not easy to get radio attention. Don't be ashamed. Share it. Like tell people. Um, and yeah, you share share everything you can. Also, you know, announce that you're doing something. Invite people to to listen early. There might be some journalists there. There might be radio shows. And also on the other side of that, look out for people saying that they're looking for music. That's another reason why it's important to use Twitter and Instagram and things, because a lot of journalists will say like, oh, I'm looking for pictures about this. We're putting together this mix series. I'm looking for this kind of music. Obviously, don't sell, send them stuff if you don't fit. But when, when you fit, send it. You never know. Um, yeah. So then there's this thing with following up. And I understand it can be scary. But um, <laughs> given we talked about like the fear of disappointment and stuff, but it's really essential. Like, don't just send one email. And, and why I want you to understand that it's important to keep stuff back is because it's much easier to follow up with someone if you've got something new to tell them, if you've got something new to share. It doesn't feel so much like, hey, did you listen and like the crushing disappointment of silence it's like hey maybe you listened but also there's this and like it just <laughs> it makes me feel better as well um but don't like send an email at five on a friday and then follow up at nine on a monday also like respect people's like holiday time i know that it's different all around the world but people have emailed me on christmas day and like <laughs> I'm not religious, but I like family time. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, there's things like that. Also, people have emailed me on New Year's Eve, like, which I do celebrate. Um, so just like think about when you're sending stuff. Like Also, Saturday night, not a great time. And you can write the email on Saturday night and get it to send on Monday morning. Like most, like Google will do that for you. Um, and yeah, the... <sighs> the disappointment of somebody telling you no, it can be crushing, and we talked about that, and you just have to smile and take it and, and trust that there's going to be other people um, and help them to place you. We've talked about it as well. So, oh, yeah, that's one thing with the general mail out. I don't follow up, obviously, with everyone that I send a general mail out to. Within that, I look at people who've maybe listened, I look at, um, and this is the advantage of my system, that I can look at who's listened, but if you use something like Fat Drop, you can as well. Um, and I pick the people most likely to actually have liked the record. Some people listen to everything, and that's because they're DJs or whatever, but with press, I'll really look at what they're interested in, and I'll just be like, hey, are you going to review it? Like, oh, I saw you listen. Did you, did you like it? Did you actually listen, or did, was it like a... Uh, just you just checked one song out and stuff and if they ignore you they ignore you um so yeah the results thing we've talked about a little bit like making sure that you use your results then send it to your distributor send it to promoters like ahead of your gig make sure that you reach out to the people that you're working with to give them the best information like if you have um, if you've got a show, make sure that they have the music, make sure that they have up-to-date artwork. If you've got radio show, whatever it is, give them stuff. Spread your network, repost everything, and 
tag media, credit photographers, credit directors. It's all part of building your ecosystem. If you support people, the chances are they'll support you back. Um, and, and, and that's the best that you can hope for, really. Um, so, <laughs> how to actually write a press release? There is no set way. Um, I like to keep them short and to the point. This is more for EPs and stuff. For albums, um, I think you can really go deep. I can spot a mile off if someone has put the concept on the top of the album. Like if you sat in a studio and you didn't make it with that intention and now you're trying to sell it to me as this grand idea of like it's about like, I don't know, women's liberation or whatever. Um, <laughs> and you're not a woman, first off. Um, I will, I can tell like concept over content is a real thing. And if I can tell, journalists can tell. If you just made music because this is what you wanted to do, that's fine. <laughs> like you don't have to have a grand concept if you didn't already have one. So avoid that and just and, and if you if you're unable to ex like explain the music and stuff, that's fine. Most people can't. You can find journalists on Twitter or whatever who will happily write press releases for you. You can just put the notes into ChatGPT and and do that for like EPs and stuff. Um, but it's a cost then, obviously, if you want to get a journalist to write about it. Most PRs, if you take them on, they'll write the press release for you. You just have to give them notes, have a little conversation about it. I completely understand that nine times out of ten, an artist cannot explain their music. Um, shouldn't have to. Like <laughs> You made the music, maybe it can speak for itself. Um, I do think with artist biogs, that's one thing that if you want a good one, you should invest in it. Um, that's not a chat GPT thing, really. Um, but there's some basic rules to help you. You know, maybe you have a writer amongst your friends, if you're not a good writer, who can help you. Maybe they want to try it. Um, there's certain things to avoid. You know, 99% of people who are in music liked it as a child. Um, <laughs> that's OK. Like, there's certain things to do, which is list your successes, list things that you're interested in, like why you went on this journey. Um, but you don't need to list every club that you've ever played at. You don't need to list every release. Like, you can leave things for people to talk about if they're to interview you. And there's other ways of giving people that information, like Discogs. Um, making sure that your Discogs is up to date with everything you've ever done, having just a list of events somewhere on your website, like this is enough. If people are interested, they'll go find it. Um, it does, it's not to be part of your biog, or you'll constantly be updating your biog as well. Um, so, press shots. Um, you don't have to get professional press shots. <laughs> um, you can do it yourself, you can get friends to do it. General rule, a portrait is good. Um, with a plain background because that's just handy for flyers and that kind of thing, like cutting you out and putting you in other things. Um, you need low res for online, high res for use newspapers and magazines. You don't need like constant press shots, but I know nowadays lots of people have them because they're feeding the Instagram machine. So, but what you need for Instagram is actually quite different to what you would need for a magazine. Um, but you don't have to spend a lot of money on these things. Like, this is a great camera, and you can just use that. Um, there sorry, is the thing you Sorry to interrupt. Sure, go for it. Just a short question. Is it kind of mandatory all around for a press shot? No, so that's the other thing. Like, there are plenty of people who don't want press shots, who don't want to show their face. Um, you can be creative. You can have someone make you a cartoon. You can cover your face. Um, I did a whole campaign with Shackleton where I got him the front cover of The Wire and he covered his face with wires. Genius. Because he didn't want his face to be shown. Like, um, and that's totally fine. You can also get a logo, like a proper EDM DJ. <laughs> Not only for the audience, for the PR people or the reporters. Yeah. If I don't want like the, skin, uh, the color of my skin to be uh, a matter. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't have. You, yeah. you don't have to show your face. You don't have to use your real name. Like the, people don't have to know more about you than you're willing to give. It's kind of shady. Why? 
what uh, to not want okay, to who is this person why th doesn't he w want to show well, space. okay, this, there's That's only... No, I don't think it's shady at all. I think that everyone has the right to privacy. And you have to remember that once something is out there on the internet, and this is also why I think PRs are important to protect people, like, it's there. You can't take it back. Or you can, but it takes a lot of time and energy and lawyers and whatever. Um, what I, the one thing I would say about that is if you are hiding behind a persona or you're covering your face or whatever and then the persona that you're using would maybe indicate if you're a man that you're a woman that I think is shady okay things like that but if you're just like you just don't want your face out there it's your right you you've already given people your soul with your music you don't have to give them your face as well um and maybe you'll decide to do it later you know, maybe you'll feel, maybe you don't feel comfortable now and in the future you will. But there aren't any rules. The only thing is you might work with a label that disagrees with you or something. So that comes down to them working with people who understand who you are as an artist and are going to respect that and help you to do that. Um, but no, I mean, I've, I've worked with plenty of people who don't show their faith. Um, and I think that's totally fine. But then you, it's also another opportunity to be creative. Like, then how do you express yourself without? Um, but Instagram won't like it because <laughs> the algorithm loves a face. Use a cat instead or skate videos. My son gets more hits for his skate videos than any of my artists combined. <laughs> Just going to put that out there. Uh, <laughs> I have a, a comment. Sure. A comment of uh, if you're indicating that you're a specific gender, but then you're not. Isn't the artist... Uh, I think Fatima ya Yamaha, I think, is a British artist. And I'm not 100% sure now, uh, but I think it's a man. Yeah. It is? Yeah. yeah. And I was a bit disappointed when I, when I learned that. And you have every right to be. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is, a whole, this is a whole other topic for discussion. Probably one we could talk about in the panel later, actually. Mm -hmm. I think that would be an interesting thing for us to pick up then. Because this isn't... It used to be a grey area, and now I'm pretty firmly black and white on this. Like, I, I mean, you can see that a lot of people over the last years have realised that that might be considered problematic and have, like, rectified it. Um, many people, but maybe not all. Um, but, yes, I think... I don't know. The, the, when you're misleading people in that way, I think that... That's if that's fine if you want to do that, but then don't be surprised if people are angry. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I would say. You have the right to anonymity, but if you're going to take on another persona, you have to be comfortable with what that might involve. And if that would involve people being like, I feel deceived, mm -hmm. then you have to be OK with that. Um, and that's an artistic choice, I guess. Um, so yeah, we talked a little bit about the paid for stuff already. So I'm actually not going to talk about that again. Um, oh yeah, so just like some really basic stuff. Synchronicity, use the same name everywhere. <laughs> Even if you have like different projects or something, maybe it's better to have one central account or name that you can gather everything under. And then within that, you can point people in different directions to different things. Um, yeah, at, when you're posting things, you can post on all your channels together. Um, make sure that you're covering all your bases. <laughs> um, just because it's, it's better to have it in as many places as, as people are going to find you. Um, you can use tools like Buffer and Sprout. They're really good for, for that kind of thing. They're not expensive. Um, some of them I think are even free for like low usage and you can also then plan things and it's it's they're really good tools I use them for resonate a lot um, have your accounts and logins and yeah build your community be active you can use discord you can create your own newsletter there's so many different ways that you can like engage beyond just social media beyond just releasing your music there's also things like Bandcamp, you can create like clubs on it and all sorts of things. Um, it's how much time you want to put into it. Like how much time do you have 
to, to building these things, to, to doing all of this. And I really think that that's like the main barrier for people doing really good DIY, themse DIY PR themselves is the time that it takes. Like, there's a reason why companies like me exist because we've done the work <laughs> and we've like we've put the time in and it's it is very labor intensive um yeah um so we talked earlier about like keeping in your bubble and stuff and i think if you just stay in your bubble then you never really grow your profile and it's really important to like reach out beyond that um, collaborating, doing your own events, maybe you can get a radio show, do a podcast. It's important to show your personality, build your community, support other people whose music you like. Even if you don't know them, you can still share stuff if you really like it. Like, there's nothing stopping you. And that's another way of, of reaching other people. Um, so with my management stuff, I do do brand things. Um, and it's a bit of a minefield and there's like certain questions that I think you have to ask. You have to know who you are being presented alongside. Like if you have ethical concerns with the company, like drinks companies, whatever it is. Um, so I think if as an artist you're getting to the point where you have brands interested in working with you, that would be the time that you should find a management consultant or a PR consultant and not necessarily do it yourself um, because yeah you can this it's it's easy to fall into problems where you haven't asked the wrong question and like with the best intentions i've seen people who were otherwise like considered very cool or very ethical and they've done like one weird branding thing and like really ruined their own brand and maybe that's just because they had shitty advice um, or they hadn't thought it through or they didn't like, yeah. So take advice if you need it and definitely get a lawyer um, if you're signing anything. And that's it. <laughs> um, I hope that was helpful. Um, if you've got questions, you can either ask them now. Anyone can email me anytime um, or find me on Instagram where I'm quite active. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. So if uh, one was to work with a PR company, then uh, as an artist, what work uh, gets reduced, but what, what do you still have to do with okay. the... Okay, so you obviously you need to have like your creative vision like set. Yeah, and yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah, beyond all stuff. of that, like yeah. uh, in terms of actually like, you know, when you're... Um, like during the campaign, like yeah, how to do it. Yeah. Okay, so you need to deliver all of the assets in a way that's usable and friendly, yeah. and you don't have to maybe deliver a press release or biog. You can talk to them about that, and they can help you with that. These would be the initial stages. You need to work together with them on the timeline and the targets, and then you should be able to, like, if you've delivered all the assets and stuff, you should be able to leave them to it for a little bit. But you should check in regularly. You should communicate when something happens, like you get a great booking or somebody comes to you with something, like communicate with them. Like all of these relationships, PR, um, publishing, booking, every single one is made better if you communicate. That doesn't mean you have to like micromanage, mm -hmm. but just being like, hey, checking in, anything new happened. If they're, if they're good, you shouldn't have to do that anyway because yeah, they'll yeah. be communicating with exactly. you regularly. And they'll ask, like, I'll be like, hey, any update on gigs? Like, what's happening? Um, but, yeah, if you, if you have any new assets, like, just keep, just keep the conversation flowing. Yeah. Like, communication is really important. That's like, even writing, it's a small thing, but, like, writing the EPK and the, I mean, writing your bio and about mm -hmm. the song and stuff... Uh, is that that's still the artist's... Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be. I think that... But I that mean, also speaks the identity, right? Like, uh, I mean, uh, most artists I know wouldn't... I mean, some write really great press releases, and I'm like, OK, thanks. Um, but a lot of artists will give me notes, um, or maybe they'll give me a quote, uh, I'll, or I'll ask for, like, the concepts or whatever, and they'll just deliver notes, and then I'll write a press release. Um, but I will charge you for that. That's the thing to remember. It's uh, maybe if it's just like a, 
an EP thing and I'm like, I can check it together in two minutes. But if you want me to write an artist biog or you want me to write a very involved album press release, then I will charge extra for that. Um, and I think pretty much everyone would. But maybe you can negotiate it. If you know that they, you want that, you can negotiate that in your first emails. Like, I want press, radio, and you to write the press release or to update my bio or whatever it is. And then they can think, oh, yeah, sure, I can just put, incorporate that into the price view. I just think it's really important to be upfront with what you actually need. Um, but if you don't understand like what's involved in PR, I understand that it's hard to know what you need and to ask for it, which is why I hope that that's like, a bit helpful yeah. for you to understand the different stages and the timeline and the planning and the process a bit, because then hopefully you can be like, OK, well, I can do that on my own, and that's what I need someone else for. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, um, that, that was really interesting. Um, I just want to follow on from one thing you said, which is that you said about if you receive, if you're lucky enough to get coverage from magazines, blogs, whatever, that's a good thing to put on your website or to include in your press cuttings and so on. I really, really agree. Um, it, uh, and from a kind of magazine perspective, it, it not just, uh, it doesn't just um, suggest that you're paying attention, but like magazines often are very happy to see kind of their, mag that, that, that an artist is paying attention to their coverage. Yeah, totally. And in my context, in terms of my magazine, at least once we have decided to do a feature because we saw someone was paying attention and so we thought, well, I can, we can have a, a productive conversation with this person. So, yeah. yeah, if you get coverage, it's good. Like, everything should be based on, like, mutual respect and understanding. Like, that's the world we actually want to live in. <laughs> so if we're able to do that and, and give credit to a magazine that covers us, and, like I said, credit the writer, credit the photographer, not just because it's going to be to your advantage, but like respect people's work. I get really happy when someone's like, thank you, Melissa, or thank you, Tailored, for your great work, or even just like when on release date, like PR by Taylor Communication, I'm like, thank you, exactly. See, did a good job. <laughs> and it's, but you, but like, it's just nice to be acknowledged, you know? Well, you, the, the same way as you do in, the, in your album credits with you, the sound engineer and mixing and the studio that you went to and like who did the artwork, like this, cr give credit where credit's due. Anything else? Or are we done? I feel like you've powered through that bit. <laughs> so um, I want to, um, we spoke earlier, but so I, there's also like an essay that goes with, with this that kind of like, uh, I, th it, I think it's called Demystifying P Music PR. Um, and I want to make that available as well to anyone who wants to read it. It's um, quite wordy, um, but hopefully informative. And um, yeah, and I, I hope this was helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for no one falling asleep in this very hot room. <laughs> I'm going to unplug.